The photograph of Elizabeth Van Ziel shocked the British public at the turn of the 20th century. Elizabeth died at the Bloemfontein concentration camp. She was an inmate along with her mother, given little food and care as her father had not yet surrendered to the British and was still fighting as a guerrilla fighter. To understand how Lizzie and the other recorded 26,000 Boers and an unrecorded 20,000 Africans met their fate, we must start at the outset of the Second Boer War. The Boers were Dutch-speaking Afrikaans who left the Cape Colonies following the British Empire's expansion into the region. Numerous republics were formed during the late 19th century, but the key players for our story are the South African Republic and the Orange Free State. As you might be aware, the area of modern-day South Africa is rich in gold and diamonds. This drew the attention of many foreign prospectors, or Aitlanders, looking to make their fortune. The question then arose whether these Aitlanders, a majority being British, would be able to vote in these Boer republics, or whether they were to be shut out as to avoid these newcomers outnumbering the Boers. It was no secret that the British Empire had desires to unify the region under their direct control, and so there was certainly resistance to giving Aitlanders the same rights. Negotiations at Bloemfontein about the rights of Aitlanders, the taxes on the gold mining industry, and demands that laws in the Boer Republics required British parliamentary approval naturally failed and ended on the 5th of June 1899. And by October the 11th, the Second Boer War had begun. A number of preemptive strikes by the Boers damaged the British infrastructure by a largely mobile mounted force, levied from the population as a militia rather than a standing army. A number of sieges were committed, buying the British time to muster a response. As a result, in 1900, a force of some 180,000 British soldiers was sent to the conflict. The Boers' fortunes faded as around 28,000 prisoners of war were rounded up, and their leadership fled into neighbouring modern-day Mozambique. The remaining soldiers were offered to lay down their arms in exchange for returning to their farms and homes. Those who took up the offer became known as the Protected Burghers. Of the 28,000 prisoners of war, some 26,000 were sent overseas, as far afield as Bermuda and even India. By the late 1900s, having control of both republics ought to have been the end of the conflict and the British victorious. But the Boers reorganised and mounted guerrilla strikes on the British troops, their communications and supplies. One of the most horrific tactics employed by the British, overseen by Lord Kitchener, was Scorched Earth. You may recognise Lord Kitchener as the famous man from the poster. The Boer guerrilla forces could melt back into the civilian populations and strike again and again. It didn't matter that the British had committed over 400,000 men to the fight when 20,000 odd guerrillas were willing to fight to the last man. The British response to any attack on them was to destroy every farm within a 16 km radius in exchange for the single attack. This was then scrapped by Lord Kitchener, who did away with the requirement for an attack at all, and began the wholesale destruction of all farms and homesteads, combined with the forcible placement of Boer women and children in these camps. Black Africans were forced into camps or as forced labourers, as to fuel the British war effort and rob the Boers of their farm workers. This then led to many more refugees being displaced, more than what would be normal in war. First established to house the protected burghers, Kitchener oversaw the transformation of refugee camps into concentration camps. A total of 45 tented camps were established to house the Boers and 66 tented camps for black Africans. At their peak, it's estimated that 115,000 were interned at the concentration camps. As Lord Kitchener said himself, these concentration camps are the most effective method of limiting the endurance of the guerrillas. This was the first instance of such camps used to pacify an entire nation of people. The camps were produced on a large scale and were run incredibly poorly. Diseases such as typhoid, measles, and dysentery ran rampant. These diseases were poorly understood at the time, and so basic preventative measures were not taken. 
due to the poor living conditions and sanitation, inmates in these camps and in particular children were very susceptible to these crippling illnesses. One in four children interned at the camps would die there. Compounding this further, a tiered system of food shelter allocations was set up. Those who had surrendered and their families were given much more food and slightly better accommodation. More so than those families where there was still a man fighting the British. The second group became known as the Undesirables and this was the case for poor Lizzie and her family. The atrocities committed in pursuit of crushing the Boers were brought to the public by Emily Hobhouse. Emily was a prominent welfare advocate, feminist and pacifist who had opposed the war since its outset. After setting up the South African Women and Children Relief Fund, she travelled and visited the camps with permission of the British military. Over the course of a few months, she first-hand saw the treatment of the interned Boers. She delivered her report in June of 1901. Although Emily Hobhouse was not able to visit any of the black African camps, though, with similar death tolls, the camps were of a similar standard. Her report was very clear. Any continuation of the camps was nothing short than the murder of innocent children. Her report in particular described how children who were fed unsuitable and insufficient food drooped in the heat. She wrote of many instances of families who had lost multiple children to the camps, clinging to their few remaining. She described seeing babies who were only a few months old dying merely hours after she had last seen them. The tents in which the Boers were consigned were of canvas material that trapped in the heat and offered no protection from the rain. Carpets of flies covered everything. There was no ground sheet, no beds or furniture. The average provisions for the undesirables were pounds of flour, two ounces of sugar and an ounce of coffee a day, with occasional meat, but it wasn't very common. Water was limited to two buckets for all needs, which would not be cleaned or boiled. Clean water was completely unavailable, and no fuel was given to boil the water. Nurses in these camps were underfed, overworked, and had no support from those who had set up the camps. There was little to no soap available, never enough to clean a child or any clothing. It was only due to pressure from Emily and her constant barrage of letters to the London press did matters improve. The government set up their own commission, led by Millicent Fawcett which only confirmed Emily's finding. Things did improve, but the damage had already been done. Emily Hobhouse was never permitted to return to the war zone or the camps, but she would later be thanked by the South Africans, who helped fund the purchase of a home for her in Cornwall. The figures from the Boer War speak for themselves. 22,000 children dead, 30,000 farms nearly all destroyed, and an estimated 46,000 civilians killed and 26,000 men shipped overseas. The British Empire didn't bother to count the black Africans who died as forced labourers and in camps just like the ones that Elizabeth Van Ziel died at, but the figure is thought to be around 20,000. The Boer Republics were all but wiped from the face of the earth. It would not be until 1910 that a new South Africa was formed. What should not be forgotten is the determination of Emily Hobhouse, who brought to the world's attention the plight of those in these concentration camps. This was a woman who fought off snakes with a parasol and went to war with the British government and military elite. Even in the 21st century, there are those who seek to downplay the role or sanitize what happened at camps such as the one that Elizabeth died in. Politicians back then insisted that Elizabeth arrived at the camp in the dreadful condition seen in her last photograph, and claimed that her condition was not due to her two-month stay there, and some who wished to portray the British Empire as a benevolent protector. It's these examples which show that this was not always the case. Mm -hmm.